Hello everyone and welcome to our call on COVID with our good friends at ACHI and in particular joining me uh, once again is Dr. Joe Thompson and for his leadership and his organization we are all very grateful. The information is so incredibly helpful in our daily lives and in uh, running the uh, various municipalities around this state. I want to welcome everyone. We have our, this is our combo call, so we have city officials and police chiefs and fire chiefs along with uh, the uh, state chamber of commerce and individual local state uh, or, or chambers of commerce as well. And so to all of you, I say uh, welcome. This is an opportunity, as I said during uh, our first phone call for the uh, local government community and the business community to put their heads together to make sure that we all stay safe and healthy and we beat this COVID together and that we also keep the economy as strong as we possibly can. I'm excited. We have a special guest today. Uh, Governor Hutchinson has joined us and I want to uh, remind everybody of a few of the general rules. Uh, we're going to go about an hour. Please keep your devices muted. If you need to ask a question or make a comment, please use the chat feature. Uh, for those of you who have my cell phone number, feel free to text me if that's easier as we get into the Q&A portion of this. Thanks again, as always, to Waymac and crew. They do a great job. Uh, this studio uh, really has helped us out over the last uh, several months and uh, for the foreseeable future. Well, uh, I want to give the governor a, a few minutes to uh, make some opening remarks. He has told me on several occasions he does not like long introductions, so I will make sure that this is short. I will tell you that the state has benefited from his public service for many, many years, and we are thankful for his leadership. And with that, Governor, I'll turn the uh, microphone over to you for a few minutes of opening comments. Uh, well, thank you, Mark. And first of all, I'm grateful for your leadership and your partnership uh, during uh, not just COVID, but through the last legislative session and for the success we've been able to achieve together. I particularly want to thank everyone, uh, all the municipal officials on here uh, that uh, worked hard to support issue one, our new highway funding program that passed with 55% of the vote, uh, which in today's world is like a landslide. So uh, thank you for uh, your uh, success in that that protects the highway and road funds for our municipal budgets. Uh, by the way, today was an exciting announcement that, as you know, uh, the legislature approved uh, two new statutes in uh, Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C., representing Arkansas, Johnny Cash and uh, Daisy Gatson Bates. And we announced today that we've raised a half a million dollars toward our $1 million goal uh, through major donors, and uh, we're opening it up to uh, the public. And so it's just exciting to see that project moving forward that uh, Senator Wallace and Representative Wardlaw sponsored. Uh, I did want to thank you also for the uh, partnership in terms of economic development. Uh, as you know, uh, whenever you are able to grow the economy, you're able to do a lot with it. And uh, there's a reason that we have a $240 million surplus in the state of Arkansas right now. And that's because individuals have taken risk, invested, created jobs. We've worked hard to recruit industry in our state. And your municipal economic developers have been incredible in terms of uh, sharing that load with us, uh, taking the lead in so many instances. I'll be uh, in Jonesboro next week for an announcement. I'm, We've had announcements in Ash Flat. Uh, we're down in Crossit. So a uh, number of things are happening across the state, uh, even though we're in the still in the middle of a pandemic. And I look out and I see uh, educators that are on here as well. And uh, we've got we we got to acknowledge our, our teachers and how uh, well they have done during this uh, pandemic. And uh, I just have such admiration for them as to how they have shown their commitment to uh, the students and how we've worked our way through this with great difficulty, but with great responsibility and, and uh, fully co committed to the well-being of our students. 
Um, whenever you look at uh, our budget, and I wanted to mention our uh, next legislative session for a moment as well, in, in our budget, I mentioned we had $240 million surplus. When I presented uh, the executive branch budget to the legislature, uh, I wanted to put $100 million of that into long-term reserve fund, which I'm optimistic that the uh, legislature will support. Uh, that will give us uh, over a quarter of a billion dollars uh, in our reserve fund in Arkansas. And whenever I became governor, we had zero. Uh, and that's important to help us to uh, lower bond rates. It's helped us to uh, make sure that we're prepared for uh, downturns in the future. Whenever it comes to our budget, the largest increase uh, in more than a decade will happen with our education funding. Uh, we're uh, accepting the adequacy committee report. Uh, that is fully funded in the budget that I presented. And uh, that allows us, uh, I hope, to support our teachers in a greater way, uh, to support our educators and to fully fund education. We do have <clears throat> two tax cut proposals uh, in my budget that I presented. And I want you all to be aware of those and uh, get feedback on them. One is to reduce the sales tax on used cars uh, under $10,000. That would go from 6.5% to 3.5%. And if I understand the uh, law, that will not impact municipalities on their sales tax revenues. Uh, but uh, I'll listen to uh, Mark on that particular point. Uh, but that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to do that. This is a very reasonable approach that will uh, limit the budget impact but also uh, uh, reduce the number of people that game the system in the purchase of and pricing of used vehicles. The other one is an economic development tool, and that is for five years, for the next five years, to reduce the uh, individual income tax rate for new residents of Arkansas to 4.9%. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity to recruit uh, high tech workers to manufacturing, if we want to bring in a company, uh, then we can use that as a sales pitch that, you know, for five years, you're going to have a 4.9% uh, individual income tax rate in Arkansas. It also sets a goal as to where we want to go uh, as a state long term to get everyone down to the same rate. We're not going to uh, have long term that discrepancy, but it's a recruitment tool it's a growth tool, and if you like that idea, you need to contact your legislators. Uh, all of these are uh, uh, subject to discussion. Now, I did also want to mention one priority that I have that's a, a challenge, and that is uh, to pass a hate crime law in Arkansas. Arkansas is one of only three states without a hate crime law. Uh, which is it's important to emphasize the law that's proposed is not a new offense category that's being created. It's simply an enhancement of the sentence of the penalty if uh, it's defined as a hate crime in which someone is targeting someone else or a group of people because of their color of their skin or because of some other characteristic that uh, they cannot change. And so we've got to uh, hopefully pass that. But when people believe in that and support that and think that's good for Arkansas, let your legislators know. They hear plenty of other voices, so they need to hear from you. And then before I end my conversation, let me address COVID, which is on everybody's mind. And there's not a moment of the day that it's not on my mind. And uh, right now, of course, we have the highest case level in terms of the growth of cases that we've ever had. Uh, and this is mirroring what is happening nationally. Every state is having the same experience. Uh, it is likely to go up today if it follows the pattern that it's been following. And uh, we need your help. You think about what we've done. We have the infrastructure that's put into place. And that's why we worked so hard in the first five months of this to make sure we had the capacity for testing uh, that we could do our contact tracing. We invest in all of this, our lab space at the Department of Health. On and on, we built our infrastructure. And then we uh, put in the simple requirements of wearing a mask, 
socially distancing. And I like thinking about uh, every White House task force, uh, Dr. Fauci, all the great epidemiologists all across the country, they give us advice on what we should do, and it's not complicated. It's the same message, wear a mask, socially distance, and uh, cleanse your hands, and, uh, and, and, and that's how we protect ourselves. That is the national message. That's what we have to do. And uh, people keep asking me, well, what more can you do? What, what ideas do you have? Well, you know, if you don't want to shut the economy down, which I do not, the solution is to follow uh, the advice of the scientists. And that's what uh, we're advocating for. We do uh, intend to have a winter ad campaign. Uh, that is in the works, and uh, it's important to continue to emphasize that in public messaging. Uh, I've taken a little bit of time today. I think we're going to have some Q&A a little bit later in the session, but Mark, thank you for the opportunity to uh, cover a few points, and, and obviously the role of our municipal officials and our leaders in our communities is critical to our success, and I'm reaching out to you today to help us uh, in this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, we're so happy you joined us. And yes, we're looking forward to some uh, questions and answers. Following our, uh, our normal protocol, uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Thompson to uh, go over his information as we've done in previous weeks. And, and I guess I'll just set it up with, how are we doing? Well, Mark, I, I think, you know, I was, thinking this is our ninth month that you and I have been doing kind of conversations with our local leaders. And we we're probably in the darkest days that we have been because of the load of COVID, because of the spread of COVID, and because we're all getting tired of doing what we know works, as the governor mentioned, but we've got to recommit and redouble our efforts to make sure that we are breaking the ex exponential spread of this virus. It is present in all communities across the state. It's increasingly taking a toll in our rural communities that did not have the exposure or the impact early on. Uh, our school officials are striving to do all they can do to keep the schools open and, and functions with educational efforts. But it's about each individual's commitment and redoubling of effort. We're gonna see some information. I think it's time for individuals and families to hit the brakes and think about a, a pause or at least a recommitment. I can tell back in April and May, I was going to the grocery store once a week and I've slacked off where I'm going three and four times a week. And I need to be more thoughtful and minimize my public exposure to safeguard myself, my family, uh, and those that um, I work with each day. So uh, we are in some dark days. There is some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine uh, news that we had earlier this week. Uh, but, but that vaccine availability is months away for the general population and the threat is growing each and every day. So let's quickly jump in and, and we'll, we'll move through this to get to Q&A with, with our special guest, the governor. Uh, you know, as the governor mentioned, the entire nation, for the most part, is experiencing uncontrolled spread. Um, this is uh, represented by spread that is, is threatening to breach our levees of that 10% threshold and that we lose control of the positivity rate. Uh, the Utah governor has actually been asked by the hospital association in Utah to allow rationing of ventilators so that they have so many people. It's not the number of ventilators, it's the staff to support them. It's a nurse, a respiratory therapist, others. Uh, the Air Force is flying into El Paso because the healthcare staff have been affected by COVID-19. We've crossed 10 million cases in the United States still the world's largest number of confirmed cases and, and are approaching 250,000 deaths. Unfortunately, Arkansas carries it, our share of that burden. We've had 126,000 total cases. These count the PCR test as confirmed and increasingly the widely used antigen test. We have over 800 individuals hospitalized. It wasn't too long ago when you and I were talking about 200 individuals hospitalized. Now we're at 800 with over 100 on the ventilators and over 2,100 deaths that have occurred. Now our new cases, as the governor mentioned in his, you can just see every week a stair step up and then a spike the last two weeks. We are seeing the effect 
I believe, of individuals coming indoors, individuals loosening their commitment to doing what we know works, and importantly, gatherings of individuals as we have small groups come together or larger groups come together. But we had almost 19, over 1,900 cases yesterday, and as the governor alluded, the rate of rise here cannot be sustained and supported by our healthcare system. Now we on our efforts have, have tried to look at trauma regions. These are regions we designed for the referrals uh, that happen from smaller hospitals going to larger hospitals. And now across all of our trauma regions, we have a number of active cases per thousand residents. You may remember when Northwest Arkansas had a spike, the other regions could help. Then Northeast Arkansas had a spike, the other regions could help. We're seeing a rise among all regions and the capacity to help each other is going to soon be eroded. Here you see the uptick by region on the daily active cases per thousand residents for each of the trauma systems. And when we have more cases, we end up having more demand on our healthcare system. And we're seeing that now with the spike in hospitalizations uh, that we've witnessed. Uh, two weeks ago, the Northeast hospitals came together with a call for help by their citizens. Just this week, the Northwest Arkansas hospitals did the same. Those are your hospitals asking on behalf of their workers and of their capacity to be able to serve our Kansans and provide high quality care for everyone to redouble their efforts and commit to breaking the spread of this virus. Unfortunately, we're seeing deaths accumulate. Uh, uh, we see a, an increase here that 147 is when the health department first started counting antigen deaths. So that's a little bit of a false spike there in the, in the middle. But you'll see that we're now having 20 to 30 deaths on most days. And importantly, the time that it's taking us to get to the next 100 deaths is shortening as we have more and more people succumb to the illness. Now, these are not deaths that would have occurred and are being recoded. These are actually additional deaths. Here you see the blue line are the average number of deaths for each of the past five years. The red line are the number of deaths that we are experiencing this year. So we're seeing about a 10% higher um, number of deaths in Arkansas this year because of COVID compared to most years in the last five. Fifty percent of our Kansans have a chronic condition and we see that those chronic conditions lead to worse outcomes. On the left here are the number, the type of conditions, immunocompromised individuals, that, those are people with um, chemotherapy needs or high dose steroids, immunocompromised, kidney failure, congestive heart failure obesity and diabetes, these lead to higher rates of hospitalization, higher rates of ICU admission, intubation, and unfortunately death. I mentioned our schools. Uh, you know, I think our schools are doing really hard work. Uh, of course, the risk that the schools experience are the risk that comes from the community, where the students come from, where the teachers and personnel come from. And we are seeing a dramatic increase in the number of schools that are in our red zone. Here's a map that we had back in the middle of October. You can see most of Arkansas was in the green zone with a little bit of a focused area up in northeast Arkansas and in the eastern part of our state. This is this, these, the next map is this week's uh, release, which will happen this afternoon. We have 44 districts that are now in, 43 districts that are now in the red zone and five that are in the purple zone. We've gone from having 127 school districts in the green to now only 58. We've gone from having only 13 in the red or, to now we have 48 in the red or the purple. This represents a loss of control that we're experiencing that is directly affecting our schools as well as our hospitals. Now we do have some promising updates on the treatment side. We have convalescent plasma. That's available under an emergency uh, use authorization by the FDA. That's where people donate their plasma. We have the antiviral remdesivir, which has been approved. We have the steroid that many of us have had a, a round with for, for poison ivy that seems to help control the inflammatory aspect. We have a new antibody, and I can't tell you where they come up with these names. Bam, lam, mivib, bam, bab. I, I can't, I mean, I think they just roll the Scrabble box and see what, the, what comes out. But this is a new antibody injection for individuals before they need to be hospitalized that has been shown to be effective in helping them not end up in the hospital. If you end up in the hospital, this drug is not available to you because it causes worse outcomes. This needs to be an early treatment. Secretary Romero mentioned earlier this week uh, the number of doses that we will get under that emergency use authorization and they'll work to have that available. The Regeneron antibody cocktail uh, that the president received still has not been approved uh, by the FDA and is not broadly available. 
on our vaccines. We have you know, 38 in the safety uh, trials, 14 in the efficacy trials, worldwide 11 here in the United States, four vaccines that are in the large scale trials. For our new listeners, uh, the, the limited approval, that's the Chinese Medical Military Academy's vaccine that didn't go through any of the safety studies, so I don't think we want there yet. You can now participate in a trial, um, either through the Baptist Health System or the UAMS system. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that people understand sound science and reliability takes time. Uh, on November the 9th, the Pfizer vaccine announced preliminary results saying that it was 90% effective. That's a huge achievement on an incredibly short time frame to get safety and effectiveness. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca recently resumed their trial after a pause and Moderna continues forward. There are three questions that we need to watch for on vaccine assessment. Is it effective? That's what Pfizer announced, they were 90% effective. Is it safe? And then how long is it gonna last? Those are the three questions that as we see vaccines come forward, we'll need to pay close attention to. Now coming back to what the governor said, we know what works, face masks work. This crafty little virus can infect you, you can be infected up to 40 to 50% of people and not know it, they're spreading it. Uh, yesterday, the CDC came out saying wearing a mask protects yourself, but wearing a mask if you're asymptomatic and infected protects all of those that are around you. There was a study out two weeks ago from Tennessee. Let me set this up. Tennessee, unlike Arkansas, each county has its own health department, so they make their own independent decisions. In Arkansas, we have a centralized health department. Tennessee has local control. Uh, half the counties chose to have a mask mandate with high uh, enforcement efforts, half did not. Um, the study from Vanderbilt looked at the number of hospitalizations from hospitals that drew from counties with and without a mask. If the hospital drew from a county that less than 25% of the patients from the counties had a mask requirement, they've experienced a 300% increase in hospitalizations just in the last month. Uh, if it was 25 to 50 percent, it was less. If it was 50 to 75 percent, it was almost zero. And if you had high compliance in those counties, uh, it, was, it was no more hospitalizations uh, at the end of October than there was at July 1st. So this is, shows, again, more and more evidence of why universal, constant commitment to mask wearing when you're in the presence of others uh, is important. And this is what we're going to be faced with in our trauma regions as these numbers continue to grow so quickly and the burden on our healthcare system becomes so great. Now we have another holiday coming up, Thanksgiving, and uh, my policy board has actually taken this on and uh, will release later today some guidance. Uh, I think this is guidance that I would encourage every family to, to take to heart and have hard conversations. Uh, we want to have, we want to give thanks, not COVID at Thanksgiving, and, and that's really one of the challenges. Their recommendation, uh, strong recommendation, is that uh, we celebrate with household members only and avoid large gatherings where you have large numbers of households traveling to come from other sites uh, and be indoors. If folks are coming together from different households, they do have a strong set of steps. By this Saturday, that's three days from now, communicate with all participants that are coming together and agree on what you're gonna to do to reduce risk. Starting this Saturday to eliminate unnecessary exposures by restricting activities such as travel, shopping, as I mentioned, go one time a week, not five times a week, uh, and dining out, use takeout. Avoid your public exposure. Prior to travel, or at least by Monday of Thanksgiving week, Get a COVID-19 PCR test so that you're confident you were not infected and in bringing that into your family. And then on Thanksgiving itself, have a plan, and they've put out 10 things to reduce risk. Limit to smaller groups, check for cold-like symptoms. Uh, the individuals with those conditions we mentioned earlier, try to protect them. Eat outdoors if at all possible. This is a respiratorily spread virus. And our homes, unlike places of business, we've worked to make our homes be sealed so that you don't get much air exchange. If you do go inside, open windows, even if that means turn a heater on and turn on your vent hoods. Don't share utensils. Have a single mask person serving people. Limit the length of the event. There are a number of other things. They're putting this out so that people can have a safe uh, and, and enjoyable Thanksgiving if you do have members coming together from other uh, sites. Now we know this works. The CDC did a case study of a family reunion in August where 20 relatives came together for a family gathering. They had a single teenager that had been exposed, was not infected yet, but had been exposed before the trip. Of the 14 relatives that shared a house, 
the teenager plus 11 other relatives came down with the infection. Of the six relatives who participated, but they didn't stay in the house, they gathered outside and they consistently wore a mask, none of those six individuals were affected. This is a crafty virus. It's claiming lives across our state. It's in every community. Let's do our best to have a safe and enjoyable Thanksgiving. So with that, look forward to questions. Appreciate the governor being on today. Anything we can do to help support the adoption of masks, the, the, the commitment across the state, uh, we need to break the, the, the transmission of this virus, which is unfortunately growing each and every day. Thank you, doctor. Uh, sobering for sure uh, and, and for all of our communities. I hope a bit of a wake up call that we really have to do better uh, at each and every level. It's just not, uh, not where we want things to be. We sure don't want our families to get sick and our friends and we don't want our economy to shut down, but we have to do better. Governor, we do have some questions and thank you again for joining us. Um, last week, you released your winter strategy to combat the virus and uh, obviously talking about masks and social distancing. I think the key here is how is, how is that going to be enforced? What, what's going to happen in the enforcement world to try to get this under control? Well, well Mark, you're going to take care of that for me, aren't you? <laughs> I thought I'd get a little chuckle there anyway. <laughs> uh, first, uh, uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, great presentation, and and thank you for uh, AKI's uh, leadership and voice during this time. It is very helpful to us, and uh, uh, particularly on the Thanksgiving message, thank you for bringing that. But uh, seriously, Mark, uh, you know what the challenge is, that uh, I believe the mask mandate has made a significant difference in Arkansas because it leaped us forward in terms of everyone understanding the importance of it and the vast majority of our Kansans uh, adopting uh, mask wearing and social distancing. Now, the difficult part is enforcement. Now, uh, I put in a tough uh, mask mandate. It does carry a misdemeanor offense uh, it's a uh, up to a $500 fine. Uh, there is a requirement for a, uh, a first warning or a first offense, and then you can uh, issue the uh, fine. Now, I got enormous uh, blowback from uh, some county sheriffs and some municipal police chiefs, and uh, you know they were troubled by this. They had a lot of questions about it, and uh, I've. Uh, I know that, uh, to my knowledge, no one has actually gotten a citation for failure to comply with a mask mandate. Uh, and it's not exactly unreasonable because, in terms of the mask mandate, because you have appropriate exceptions in there. Obviously, when you're outside, you can social distance. Uh, there's adequate exceptions, but you're in a crowded environment. That's what you're supposed to do. I need our municipal officials to support uh, the enforcement of the mask mandate. Now that simply can mean uh, you've got to first educate them. I mean, we're a friendly state. You're going to go by and you're going to say, uh, don't forget, uh, there's an obligation to uh, uh, wear a face covering. Uh, and if they don't, give them a verbal warning. That's what the uh, mandate allows. And then make a note of that. Uh, the next time that happens, if they're just belligerent about it, uh, you can give them a ticket for it. And so uh, primarily through education, and I believe that's what works, but we need our local municipal officials to both educate and encourage the wearing of masks. And so every voice that you have uh, in that way can help us. Uh, if I can be helpful in providing more information or guidance on this, uh, Doug Smith would be a good one to uh, contact in my office. That's one of the things that we're doing. The other thing about the enforcement is I'm putting our ABC enforcement officials every week, they're doing compliance checks of restaurants, of bars. Our health department is doing this. Our health department is responding to complaints. And so you might uh, simply file a complaint when you see a business uh, that is not complying, make sure we know about it, the health department so we can take the steps uh, to remedy that problem. Uh, and that's how we take it seriously, and that's how we
can uh, hopefully free up some of our hospital space. Very much. Uh, Dr. Thompson, do you have a comment? Let me just add, and, and Governor, I want to echo and, and reinforce, we need our business community to step up too. I was camping in the last few days and needed some supplies, and I went in and there's a big sign on the door, masks optional. We need all of our businesses to say, this is for the protection of your customers, your employees, you and your family. Uh, and, and anytime a customer sees non-compliance or explicit, you know, kind of non-awareness, uh, vote with your feet, go somewhere else. Don't patronize that business if they're not gonna help protect your health. Thank you. Uh, Governor, let's, let's move to the vaccine, which I think all of us uh, hope happens sooner rather than later. When it's finally approved, do you have any thoughts on how it might be rolled out in our state? I had a conversation with Secretary Azar about 10 days ago, and he said that they are prepared uh, within, I believe it's 24 hours of the emergency youth authorization being provided by the FDA uh, to have the vaccine out in the states. And so they are ready to move. That's their operation warp speed. They've got their uh, contracts in place with the private sector prepared to move and distribute that vaccine. The vaccine, of course, will be prioritized. As Dr. Thompson mentioned, it'll be some many months before it actually gets to uh, the uh, public in general, but it'll first go to our healthcare workers that are on the front line. It will go to the vulnerable citizens in our nursing homes, uh, trying to prevent those deaths and uh, recurrence. And so those will be the early priorities. Uh, and then uh, we will start getting it out more to the public uh, and our system will be in place. We'll have plenty of partners for this. Uh, we've got to wait and see whether it's one vaccine, two vaccines and exactly what the requirements are. Uh, you know, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, uh, you know, provides for very low uh, temperatures, uh, freezing, uh, way below freezing. And so that takes special equipment. It will be delivered uh, directly from the supplier, manufacturer, through the distribution channel, uh, partly to the state of Arkansas, and we'll have our supply of the Department of Health, but it'll also go directly to who we designate. So it could be going to each hospital. So the uh, care workers will have uh, the vaccine available. That will be the start of the process. And once it's approved, it's going to move very quickly. Thank you very much. We've heard some comments about a quote unquote pause. Are there circumstances where you might consider that? And what would that look like? Well, that, a pause is not what anyone wants. Uh, when you're looking at the struggles of our small businesses, our tourism industry, uh, you know, you don't want to be a, to say uh, nobody needs to go to those stores anymore. You need to have more layoffs. And particularly whenever we know the solution is the social distancing and wearing the mask. And so that's the first option. The only thing that will trigger anything is uh, that if we have to, uh, we don't have any hospital space to deal with. Then you have to start making some very, very difficult decisions that you don't want to have to make. And so we need the public to come through on that. Uh, one of the things I'll be announcing uh, either later today or tomorrow uh, will be a COVID-19 winter task force. And this is specifically addressed uh, to uh, looking at the winter and our hospitalization uh, levels and uh, what steps uh, we can take uh, to make sure that we uh, don't uh, use up all of our space, we manage it properly. And so we've got a lot of work to do uh, in terms of uh, economic pause. Uh, it's, it's not what uh, we want. I don't expect that to happen, uh, but you know, whenever you're dealing with this uh, virus, uh, you've got to keep uh, options on the table and not foreclose anything. Absolutely, and of course the mask, uh, uh, social distancing and hygiene uh, would prevent that if we can get everybody on board. Uh, during uh, Tuesday's press conference, um, uh, yeah, I believe you mentioned that hospitals are making adjustments due to the high number of, 
hospitalizations we're seeing across the state. Do you know what those adjustments are uh, at this point, and are you concerned uh, about the personnel that perhaps are having to make those adjustments? Well, it's not a good situation to be in whenever a hospital has to uh, tell a surgeon, uh, do you really have an emergency surgery here? Uh, because when they come out of surgery, they're gonna need a ventilator. We need to save that ventilator uh, or the ICU space for uh, COVID patients. And so if you can delay that surgery, let's do it. That's the kind of adjustments that they have to manage. And uh, while it is manageable for a short period of time, that uh, compromises the health of everyone uh, because you have to wait to get the elective surgery that you need or you postpone something that's important, but there's not an ICU uh, uh, bed space available for you. That's one of the adjustments. The other one is, and I, this is where I applaud the hospitals, they work so closely together. I mean, they're competitors in some ways, uh, but uh, they'll call up a fellow hospital uh, what's your capacity? What does it look like? Can you take these patients? Uh, another adjustment is uh, we right now take uh, patients, uh, you know, in Jonesboro, you'll be having patients from uh, south, uh, southeast Missouri, uh, maybe Tennessee that come in, in uh, Fort Smith from Oklahoma, uh, in Rogers, you'll be having them come in from Missouri and Oklahoma. Uh, you know, obviously in the South, you'll have them come in from Louisiana. Well, you know, that's going to have to be curtailed. Uh, if they're swamped with their COVID patients and they want to send them to us, uh, we cannot uh, prioritize that. That's another adjustment that they might make. So those are a couple of them. Uh, one of the big challenges, of course, is the staffing. And uh, we've got to look at ways to support the retention of staff so that we're not losing our highly trained, skilled uh, nursing workers to other states that's paying them a little bit more to be a contract worker there. So we've got to look at the whole uh, realm of uh, responses, and that's one of the things uh, this uh, task force will be looking at. Mark, if I could just add. I agree with Absolutely. everything the governor just said. From talking with hospital CEOs and, and actually physicians, and even yesterday on a call I did with the superintendents of the Southeast Educational Co-op, the risk to the workforce of the community risk growing is significant. I mean, not only is the demand growing because of patient volume, but the risk to the workforce is growing because of the community spread. So we had on the call yesterday with some of the school districts, they'd lost their entire maintenance department for the next 14 days because two of their individuals had come down with COVID or the cafeteria workers. The same can happen in a hospital when you, you lose a cadre of nurses or respiratory therapists. To have a ventilator takes a nurse, a respiratory therapist and physician support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, week on, week off. And you can't take a hit on the workforce because the community's allowing the virus to spread which takes us right back to the simple solutions that we all know work. Uh, Governor, I, I, on behalf of the nearly 500 cities and towns in Arkansas, I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Uh, I, I'm sure the chambers feel exactly the same way. It is critical that these partnerships exist and that we all work together. I'd like to give you some uh, additional time for commentary if you if you'd like to do that and, and let you know that uh, we're committed to this partnership. We're committed as cities and towns to keep our state healthy and safe uh, and to work with our economic partners locally to make sure that we can do the very best we can for them as well. Uh, if you have some comments, Governor, we'd love to hear from you. Well, I do have one uh, closing thought and that is your voice is more important in my voice. Uh, and I say that in the sense that if we have every leader in the communities articulating what Dr. Thompson has talked about, that's repeating the message that we're reinforcing and you're doing it at the local community level, then that is the most effective thing that we can do. Uh, I, I know that I challenged Northeast Arkansas to uh, uh, do more and uh, they had an incredible session that they brought in uh, their hospital 
administrators or business people. It was a Zoom call, but it, it was really a focused attention on, on the responsibility that each of them have. And, and Northwest Arkansas did that, uh, you know, and the leadership in different parts of the state have taken ownership of it. And your voice is critically important as we fight this pandemic. Don't underestimate what it means when you set the right example by wearing a face covering. When you uh, set the right example in the appropriate way to encourage someone else and don't diminish uh, this virus and that we are sensitive, remind them of the hospitals and how crowded they are and how strained everyone is. Your leadership in a pandemic is critical. I'm grateful for it. Thank you for what you've done and will continue to do. Thank you so much, Governor. We appreciate your leadership so very much and you taking the time to join us today is also greatly appreciated. Uh, Dr. Thompson, we have a few uh, questions and not suspect- No curveballs, we'll, right? Just, just straight, we'll find out. straight fastballs. Uh, we'll see what I get. We'll see what I get on the, uh, on the special screen here in a few minutes, but we do have a few that were already sure. in, the, in the mix. Let, let's go back to the hospitalizations. How concerned are you with this increase? I, I, don't, I don't even want to call it an uptick because it really is more than that. It is more than that, and, and I think the governor mentioned our hospitals are going to start to have to shift capacity from providing care that they would routinely provide to meeting the demand that COVID-19 is requiring. Uh, I am concerned about our hospitals. Those upticks in every trauma region means the ability of those hospitals to help each other is being eroded because of the increased load that they are actually carrying. Uh, so, so I don't think it's necessarily a time for alarm, but I think there is a, an alarm signal going off that it is time for action. Fair enough. Uh, let's talk uh, and expand a little bit uh, on some of the discussion about vaccines. Um, there's the effectiveness, which Pfizer came out uh, with great news that they believe it's 90% effective, at least their version of the uh, vaccine. And you made the points regarding safety and duration. Right. So let's kind of go back to those again and make sure we're all clearly understanding the distinctions between sure. those. So, so each of the vaccines under trial are in a randomized control trial. That means people have been randomly assigned to either get the vaccine or not. And they are in a blinded treatment protocol, meaning the company and those clinicians treating them don't know who got the vaccine or not. So at the end, they're gonna look at the data and it looks like, it's reported, Pfizer thinks that they may have a vaccine that is 90% effective, meaning that the vaccine convinces your immune system that this is a threat and get your immune system ready in case you are exposed to COVID-19. But the safety information is there that we have not heard about, and importantly, how long it lasts. The measles shot, when you get that, lasts a lifetime. The flu shot, unfortunately, because it's a respiratory virus like COVID-19, it changes a little each year, and so you have to get a flu shot each year. We don't know the duration. You can't rush time. We're just going to have to wait and see the performance character, ter, characteristics of each of the, these vaccines. I would caution, I think we need to look at the data and let the scientists evaluate each of those three, effectiveness, safety, and duration. Clearly, the vaccine manufacturers have a huge, um, I would just say a huge financial incentive to be the first and the best to come to market. Uh, so let's let the data and the science help tell us which are the most effective, which are the safest, which last the longest. Which of course means why we have the federal regulatory programs Correct. in place that we do, we need to let them do their jobs. Correct. They need to do their jobs in an independent, data-driven fashion. Uh, you know, the the ACI Thanksgiving COVID prevention strategy that y'all have come up with. Let's go through a sure. little bit more what families ought to consider and let's re revisit that list of conditions that have a higher rate of hospitalization, ICU admission, death. And, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times. I, I have rheumatoid arthritis, it's an autoimmune disease and it, it scares me to no end to think that I, you know, what, what might occur to me or others who sure. suffer autoimmune sure. diseases. So let's, let's back up, talk about families, and then let's discuss these, uh, the folks in our lives that may have special sure. 
medical circumstances. So our board, which is made up of a diverse group, uh, primary care specialists, hospitals, small business, large business, uh, represents largely the state of Arkansas as a whole, with 21 people, feel strongly that Arkansans should think about this holiday season in a different way. Not to change Thanksgiving, not to change Christmas forever, but to change Thanksgiving and Christmas and other family gatherings uh, this year. That list of conditions that we put up, immunocompromised being the first, uh, kidney failure being the second, congestive heart failure being the third, diabetes being the fourth, 50% of our Kansans have a chronic condition like you're talking about. And those conditions make you less able, should you become infected, to battle the virus off and make you more likely to have one of those bad outcomes. So this is not a handful of people that have these conditions. Right. It's 50% of our Kansans. And that's why our board came out. Number one recommendation is to strongly consider having only your household together on Thanksgiving today and join others electronically, whether that's by phone or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever mechanism you can. Number one recommendation is think about not coming together. For those families that are coming together, they put a very strong issue in place saying, you got to do it smartly. Uh, you shouldn't be afraid, but you got to do it smartly. And that is starting this weekend, have a conversation with all of the family units that are going to come together and make sure you can get agreement that it is risky, but that you're going to do something to manage the risk. I've got employees that when they had this conversation, they couldn't get agreement. And so the recommendation, if you can't get agreement to manage the risk, don't come together and assume the potential outcomes. So have the conversation this week end. Starting this weekend, because we're now two weeks ahead of Thanksgiving, modify your behavior, reduce your external exposure, don't go out to bars, restaurants, go to the grocery store as minimal number of times as you can. Really try to reduce your, your exposure. Prior to travel, we'll have a lot of people traveling at the end of next week or the first part of the following week. Prior to travel, or no later than Monday of that week because it takes two days to get back, if you're coming together, everybody get a PCR test. And then on Thanksgiving, have a plan. One of the things in, in our, our review is really interesting. Many of our commercial buildings, our schools, they have a requirement for a certain amount of air turnover every minute, every hour. If you're in a nail salon, for example, for each person, there's 20 cubic feet of air that has to exchange each minute. If you're in a school, it's about five. If in some other office building, it's 10. Well, in our homes, we've done the exact opposite. We've tried to seal everything up so that we're energy efficient and we don't have ventilation exchange. So if you're gonna be together, open the windows and get ventilation going. What would even be better is if weather permits, hold it outside. So that, not sharing uh, utensils, making sure people wear a mask. If you have folks staying overnight, try to distance as much as you can and don't let your guard down like we saw in that CDC case study with people feeling like, well, this is my cousin, he's not gonna hurt me, but your cousin may not know that he's infected and this crafty little virus is spreading among your household even as you sit watching a Thanksgiving afternoon football game. And that's, uh, if you back up getting the PCR test helps you a couple of days in advance, at least at that point, you would know the result right. and you could say, if you're positive, I'm, you're not going. Yeah, I'm staying at, I'm That's staying right. at home. This okay. is logic. You know, we're in a pandemic, we're in uncharted waters, but let's use what we know to safeguard those that we love. Absolutely. Uh, I don't see any submitted questions as of yet. But uh, I, I did get a text, and I, I think this is interesting. We've had at least one city uh, who has issued memorandum to uh, all of the local businesses, reminding them of the things that work, but, but also reminding them that the numbers are going up. And in, in a particular place, they may be worse than, uh, than others. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think. I think this is uh, much uh, along the lines of what the governor was saying is that at that local level, taking those additional steps could, could have a, a very positive impact. And particularly if it was done consistently and with more, more cities doing that kind of thing. I think city leadership has a responsibility to reinforce the expectation of both businesses and families. So anything a city can do to help assist in that, I would highly recommend. On our businesses, and this is where I was really disappointed in the business that I went to, 
I don't think you should get liability protection for COVID damages if you're going to flaunt the state mandate and not work as part of the team to enforce and reinforce mask mandate, mask mandate social distancing, and hand washing. Uh, the risk is growing in communities across our state, particularly in rural communities. We need all hands on deck to try to break the spread of this virus. You know, the governor pointed out, and, and he's right, we're, we are a friendly state. And, and I have noticed in some of my own personal um, in, uh, incidents where I've said to somebody, hey, uh, you know, would you mind kind of backing up a little bit? You're not wearing a mask. Uh, I, I haven't gotten into any sort of clash about that, but clearly in the outside world that we see on social media, there have been plenty of volatile situations. Uh, obviously, it doesn't help anybody. I don't know if you have any thoughts on how to uh, work through that, but from my perspective, the best thing to do is just get out of the way. You know, the, the virus did magically disappear after the election last week. It's still with us. Uh, those increased numbers of deaths are not a misclassification of death. We're right. having 10 to 15 percent more deaths this year than we did the same time the last five years, and it's caused by COVID. This is a real risk. It's a crafty virus. It's transmitted from respiratory droplets, and you can be infected and not know it and be spreading it yourself. Folks need to take this seriously and with your pocketbook, go to those places that have high levels of compliance. In your personal space, make sure that you are protecting yourself and others that are around you. And finally, in the communication, as the governor said, we are all leaders in our own way, whether it's of the municipal league, whether it's of an organization like myself, in our families, in our communities. As leaders, reinforce that this is a real and present danger and that we need to take steps. We know the steps to take, we need to take those steps to break the spread. We're gonna be, I suspect, over 2,000 new cases today, and I hope it's a long time, but I'm afraid it's gonna be a short time that we're over 3,000. This is growing, the risk is present, and the harm is being done. And we've had previous discussions about the, 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 the exhaustion that we are all uh, suffering from as a result of this kind of new discipline that we're in. We've talked about checking on people that we, that we know have addiction issues or depressive disorder issues and things like that. I just got a, a question in it, and I'd forgotten. I, I actually saw the, uh, an article on this uh, earlier this week. Uh, Oxford uh, University studied a link between COVID and increased risks of psychiatric disorders and dementia um, are you are you aware sure. of that study and have you seen anything in Arkansas that that would lend credence to that concern? Sure. Uh, I am aware we did look at that study. Uh, it adds to our knowledge as we've talked before as we learn more about COVID-19. We spent some time before about the damage COVID can do to your heart, you know, with 30 percent of folks potentially having inflammation of the heart. This study looked at mental illness and dementia and it found that of individuals who had had COVID, with no previous dementia or mental illness, 5% had memory problems or a new mental illness after COVID. Of those that had previously had dementia or mental illness, 20% became worse. So I think this is, again, a crafty virus that initially we knew affected your lungs at first, but we're seeing it affect other organs, and this is one that you want to avoid because of the potential cardiac damage, because of the potential brain damage, because of the potential mental health issues. Um, this is just something we know how to not get it, and we don't want to give it to anyone that we love or that we know. And I, I'm going to reiterate the call for, uh, for all of us to touch base with people that we know uh, are depressed Correct. or have had a de depressive disorder, have had an addiction problem, or uh, are recovering from an addiction problem. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. I can assure you from personal circumstances that uh, it's painful to hear that people you love may have uh, either a, a, a mental health issue or a, an addiction issue, but we need to know it and we need to check on those people. That's our, yep. uh, we're, we're good Arkansans, we're good people and we don't need to leave folks behind. Um, I don't believe we have any other questions, so just a couple of brief comments and we'll sign off. 
Governor, again, thank you so much for uh, joining us and rest assured that the municipalities of this state uh, are your uh, partner and intend on working as hard as we can to, to eliminate this awful, awful virus. Uh, coming up, oh, we well, spoke too soon. We got another, another one coming in, I believe. It hadn't arrived yet, but as soon as it does, I'll address it. A couple of quick things to remind uh, folks of. Uh, we had a uh, 783 folks register for our, uh, our virtual convention. We've got our virtual winter conference coming up, uh, and we, all, we have 297. I'd like to see that get beat uh, by a substantial amount. It's free. All you have to do is get on your computer and get registered. So uh, let's see if we can push that to 1,000 if we could. Now, uh, there's the text message. Looks like I've got two um, questions here. Uh, where can we go to get a test to see if, we've, if we have, uh, have had COVID? Um, so have had COVID is actually checking that antibody test. You right. remember we had three types of tests. One is the PCR, the molecular test. That's our best. The rapid antigen is the quickest. And then downstream after you've had it, you can get an antibody test. Uh, the the uh, blood bank, when you donate blood now, is doing an antibody test and supposedly giving you the results back. Uh, your local physician can actually do an antibody test. The performance is still not great. So I think, you know, getting an antibody test may help you, but you still need to have protections in place to keep from coming in contact or contracting the illness. You know, we always need blood donations yep. from people that are yep. healthy. So And blood donations yeah. are down now right. because of the of this isolation, the the, the uh, restrictions that we've had in place. So the non the non medical answer for me is, go get blood. Yep. You'll get tested. You'll get a test. You'll know, and you'll help your uh, your fellow Arkansans out as well. Uh, here's a here's another uh, mass question. Uh, apparently, this person made a call to the uh, to the Department of Health yesterday and was told the mask was only effective and considered to have protected an individual from a positive case if it were an N95 mask. It implies that all other masks are inconsequential. Uh, that sounds contrary to everything that I think that's heard. a I think that's a false statement. I don't know how the miscommunication occurred. Right. Uh, the reality is any kind of facial covering that captures your respiratory droplets as expressed or protects you from somebody else's respiratory droplets that have been expressed right. is beneficial. We know that bandanas that are loose fitting do not help. We know that the gaiters that are close fitting worsen because they fractionate the droplets and make them smaller and last longer. But it turns it into an aerosol. That's right. But any, basically just any other mask like helps. with a spray can. That's right. Now the N95 masks, for those individuals in the healthcare setting and other spaces, it requires a special fitting, so you have to get it right for it to work. But if you know you are going into an infected space on a recurrent basis, the N95 mask is probably appropriate to give you optimal protection knowing that you're going to be infected. Mark, let me offer, and, and we'll have this family checklist up this afternoon. Be glad to share it with you and your Absolutely. team. Absolutely, please do. I would encourage every leader, and I go back to my definition of whatever leadership role you have, every leader, to share this with your family members, your employees, have the conversation. This threat is present, it's growing, we can break it but we got to break it by working together. And I hope this checklist gives both some dates by when you need to take action and some logical steps that can be taken by every family across the state of Arkansas to reduce the chance that, that Thanksgiving uh, invites COVID to the table when it's unwanted. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank the entire ACHI team. You guys are terrific to work with. Uh, the WayMac crew, this, oh, I've got another one just popped up here. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, it's actually, it looks like two questions, I think. Um, do you know how far behind contact tracers are? And this person says they know people who have uh, tested positive Saturday and Sunday, and they have not been count contacted yet. I do not know how far. We have seen reports uh, from the two big contractors that the state hired, AFMC and General Dynamics, that there are as many as 10 to 12% of individuals that they cannot find. 
So I think it's important uh, for uh, individuals who know that they've been positive, if they haven't been contacted, there is a hotline at the health department. Feel free to go on and call in so that you make a connection. It may be that they, they got a telephone number wrong, so they can't find you. Uh, we know that 10 to 12 percent of individuals that have been tested positive, the health department and its contractors have not been able to find. So if you're not called after you get a positive test within 24 hours, I would encourage you to go on the hotline with the health department and do your part to plug in and give the information so the health department can execute their contact tracing. Uh, quick, another mask question. Uh, some epidemi epidemiologists have advocated surgical masks versus cloth masks. You got any quick thoughts on that before we sign off? You have a gradient here from, you know, facial coverings made homemade or other cloth, surgical masks, and then your N95 masks. Obviously, the more you go over towards the N95, the more protection it is, but also the more challenging, again, because of the fitting required on the 95. Surgical mask, if in good supply, I would strongly recommend. I think it reinforces to everybody this is a, this is a health risk. Uh, but any facial covering that blocks the transmission of those respiratory droplets is beneficial. Thank you very much. So back to my, uh, my closing here. Uh, Folks at the uh, Waymac and crew, what a wonderful group of people and a great studio. We thank you so much. Uh, Colin and Emily, if you're listening, I'm going to call you to get a PCR test before you head to Arkansas. And uh, I want to thank the entire membership for joining us, Chamber of Commerce folks, uh, both state and local. Thank you so much for being on this call. We are in partnership together. We cannot survive without each other. And so let's, let's work together to make sure that we're masking, we're staying apart from each other, and we're practicing good hygiene. And uh, to the police chiefs and fire chiefs, thank you as well uh, for joining us. So with that, I'm going to say what I always say, wear a mask, stay six feet apart from each other, practice good hygiene. Peace.